Welcome back to Thrive and Fusion. Take a walk with me as I explain the game that we're gonna be doing. The point of this game today is we're gonna be going fast. And in honor of that, we're gonna be explaining this flat fast. Guys, we have a drag race on our hands. A drag race, not with motorized RC cars, whatever it is, but with actual Razor scooters. Yes, you heard that right. We have two contestants. They're bloodthirsty. They're ready to go head to head. And we are gonna be going down this track that we're walking right now. The balloons, as you see, are put on each of these walls and doors. Why, you may ask? Because the racers cannot progress through unless they pop a balloon. There are eight balloons total. Four for each person. One, two, and as we continue on. Yeah, why don't we step up the tempo also? We're gonna get going here. Three, another set of balloons. And basically, they're gonna start in the middle circle in the welcome center, make it all the way through, popping each of their balloons. Finally finishing within the inner circle. But to get into the inner circle, you guessed it, you must pop a balloon. Guys, you're gonna wanna root for the right person here. Get ready, get set, let's go. Contestants, welcome. Here's the game, drag race. We have Becca representing the girls and Zach representing the guys. How do you guys feel? Confident. confident. Honestly, not that confident, but I think I'll be confident. Okay, looks like we already have a, somebody in the lead here. All right, we're gonna start on one and you guys are gonna go. On, on, okay, one, three, two, one, go. Okay, three, two, one, go! Here we go. <laughs> Zach, Lily, Becca, you cannot give up. Zach seems to be making a, a play here. He goes for the final balloon, pops it. Zach is the winner. Zach, congratulations, buddy. Let's see how far back your competition is. Here it is. All right, thank you for playing. Zach, how do you Sorry, feel? Everyone. I didn't expect anything else. <laughs> That's right, a tough workout. <laughs> All right, let's go ahead and throw it to our next place. Peace. What's up everybody, my name is Eli and we're so glad you're tuning in today. Um, wasn't that a crazy game? I've always wanted to race around the church on scooters. Um, stay tuned on Instagram and YouTube as we continue to put out videos there. We'd love to have you join us. Um, this week's challenge is a lip sync battle, so we want you to uh, record your best lip sync to your favorite song and then send it to a students at blackrock.org and uh, the staff here will vote to which one's the best. So have fun doing that, and now we're going to head into a time of worship. People who come together with strangers, neighbors, our blood is one. Children of generations of every nation of kingdom come. Oh, don't let your heart be troubled. Hold your head up. I don't fear no evil. Fix your eyes on this one truth. God is madly in love with you. So take courage, hold on, be strong. Remember where love comes from. Oh, 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 o
sin is blue and Jesus out of heaven your friend forever his kingdom come oh don't let your heart be troubled God is madly in love with you, so take courage, hold on, be strong, remember where help comes from, oh, 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 Everything with breath, repeat the sound of His children. Clean hands, pure hearts, good grace, good God. His name is Jesus. So sweet wine, are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Our creation, everything. Sound of his children, clean and pure arms, good grace, good God, his name is Jesus. Sweet wine, sweet wine, are you heavens? Let the praise go up as the walls come down. Our creation, everything with breath, repeat the sound of his children. His name is Jesus. The reason most people don't believe this book is not because it contradicts itself, but because it contradicts them. It's not that they can't believe it, it's that they won't. Because in a world obsessed with equality, this book speaks with authority. In a generation content with naturalistic explanations, this book affirms supernatural realities. In a society stuck on relativity, this book is full of absolutes. In a civilization captivated by sensuality, this book esteems purity. In a culture infatuated with self-discovery and self-fulfillment, this book calls for self-denial and self-sacrifice. In a time when we're taught that all roads lead to heaven, this book says no one gets to heaven without Jesus. This book tells the truth. The truth about life and death. 
heaven and hell, right and wrong, Savior and sinners. Thousands of characters, hundreds of stories, but one unmistakably clear message. The redemption of fallen humanity through Jesus Christ for the glory of God. The stories of this book will surprise you. A man kills his brother and a father his son. Shepherds become kings and kings become criminals. The righteous are rebuked, but prostitutes are forgiven. Sinners live, but the Savior dies. It's not diplomatic, it's not discreet. It's not irrelevant and it's not incorrect. It's not trivial and it's not tolerant. It is holy and righteous. It is good and true. It is powerful and pure. It is sweeter than honey and finer than gold. It's a map that leads you through the great storms of life. It's a lamp that gives you light amidst blinding darkness. It's a mirror who tells you who you really are. It's a sword that cuts deep into your guilty conscience. It's a hammer that breaks your heart into pieces. And it's the glue that puts it back together better than before. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The rock solid Bible. Stand firm on its foundation. Walk in its paths. Tweet it. Share it. Blog it. Spread it. Unshakable, unwavering, rock solid truth. The rock solid Bible. Read the stories, study the teachings, share the blessings, believe the prophecies, quote the promises, and apply the wisdom. The Rock Solid Bible. Make it your holy addiction. Make it your sacred obsession. Make it your sanctified passion. The Rock Solid Bible. Don't twist its words. Don't neglect its strength. Don't presume it's just words on a page for ancient people long dead. No, the Word of God is living and active here and now. And if you're spiritually dead, it'll bring you to life. Hey everyone, welcome back to my house. Tonight we are wrapping up this series that I have called Essential. And I said it's bittersweet because this is my last series, but I'm just super excited because I get to just speak into your guys' life things that are important, things that are essential for us in our journey on this adventure that we're on with Jesus. And so just super excited about that. Now, week one that we kicked off two weeks ago, uh, we looked at the fact that we are made essentially new, that we are new in Christ, that when we enter into a relationship with Jesus, when when we enter uh, and, and find salvation in Him, we are made new, which means that, guys, uh, we are not our old selves. Our past uh, before Jesus, good and for bad, um, that does, no longer defines who we are. We have been made new in Christ. Um, we are now sons and daughters of the King of Kings. We are co-heirs with Christ. And our goal is each and every day is we made more like Him. Um, and it's essential that we understand that we are being made essentially new in Jesus. Now, last week, week two, was a little bit tougher of a subject. We looked at the fact that, hey, even though salvation is free, following Jesus has a high cost. There's a cost to it. In fact, following Jesus, he asks us to give up, give up everything for his sake. Who we live for, uh, who we're trying to please, who we take our cues from, is from no one other than him, than Jesus. The cost is high and the way is hard, but when we surrender to the Holy Spirit, we are given everything we need to flourish. And it's essential for us to understand that there is a cost in following Jesus, but it is worth the cost. So that's kind of where we were. And tonight, we're going to look at another essential for following Jesus. And as you probably guessed from that intro video that you just watched, uh, we are talking about God's Word here tonight, Um, the Bible. This 
in of itself is a, is a huge topic, but I hope that you guys see tonight is that the Bible is an essential source for us in following Jesus. Uh, and there are three reasons I want to give you tonight as to why we need to study the Bible. And here's the first reason. The Bible, guys, is an essential source to stand firm. Uh, check out what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7, starting in verse 24. Here's what, here's what Jesus says. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes, it's in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against the house, it won't collapse because it's built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish. Like a person who builds a house on sand, when the rains and the floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse in a mighty crash. <laughs> crash. Um, Jesus refers to the Bible, his words, as truth, as the rock on which we can build our lives. Um, it's our foundation. It's what we, it's that building block where we start from. Because when we do that, life is easy. Well, actually, that's actually not what Jesus says. Um, when Jesus says here is that, hey, when the storms of life come, because they're going to come no matter what, they're coming. And we, but when they do and they come and they beat against us, we can stand firm. We can weather the storm. Why? Why can we do that? Because we have a solid foundation, rock solid. But here's the thing. Sometimes we get this idea that we can kind of like pick and choose, right? Um, what we want to believe in God's word. And I get that because some of the things that we see in God's word are pretty hard to swallow. Uh, it's not just intellectually hard to swallow. Sometimes it's relationally hard to swallow. Sometimes it's emotionally hard for us to swallow. But sometimes when we start picking and choosing, um, sometimes we start doing that. We start picking and choosing things. And um, I, you know, like, hey, I believe Jesus died for my sins and all. I like that, but I, I don't know. And this is pretty hard to believe. I mean, I thought Jesus was all about love. Why is this in here? I don't like that. I mean, come on. I mean, this world has come so far since back in Jesus' day. I really don't think this is relevant anymore. Guys, I want to share with you a few reasons why it's dangerous for us to pick and choose from God's word. The first thing is that opinions change. It might be hard for you guys to see at this stage in your life, but as you get older, which I have a lot of experience in, um, you begin to see that culture is constantly changing, even in the morality department. What one generation held high as a virtue, uh, the following generations may not hold so high. In fact, they might put another virtue in its place. Or what one generation saw as being totally wrong, another generation deems as being perfectly okay. Um, and this is nothing new. This has been happening for thousands and thousands of years, back and forth. It's kind of almost cyclical how, how it just keeps changing and coming back. But as culture changes, as generations and leaders come and go, opinions change. Um, and we even see that see this back um, in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 40, verses 6 to 8. And here's, here's what we read. All flesh is grass, and all its beauty is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of, the, of our God will stand forever. See, God here is speaking to Israel uh, in the midst of... Uh, of a lot of chaos, uh, telling them to rest in his promises. Because see, Israel, because of kind of the rebellion, had been exiled, they've been conquered. Uh, but it hasn't just been all smooth sailing since then. In fact, um, they have seen two world powers fall that had conquered them. First Assyria and now Babylon, and they had fallen. And they kind of had this fear of, man, what's next? What's going to happen next? What are we going to expect? Because every time there was that changeover, life looked different. And the way people thought and acted and the rules by which they had to live by might have been different. And so one of the things that God is telling them is saying, hey, rest in my word. Because everything else around you may change, but I will not. See, for us, we can follow our cultures. We can put our eggs in that basket, but times will change again. 
And when what you put your trust in changes, it shows that those opinions were any more powerful than the feeble human beings who held those opinions. But see, guys, God and his word stands forever. It doesn't change. It's rock solid. It's that foundation that we can stand upon. Another reason why it's dangerous for us to pick and choose uh, what, the, what we believe in the Bible is that our foundation can be wrecked. You know, we might look at it, at God's word, and maybe there's some things we don't like in it. Like we might say, I mean, did Jesus really walk on water? I don't believe that. And I imagine if your foundation, if, it, if that's God's word, and, and let's say, you know, initially it's strong, it's solid, kind of like a tower of Jenga, okay? It's stand there firm, it's there, right? And everything else. But as maybe you're like, man, did Jesus really walk on water? I don't think that's scientifically possible. You know what? I just, I, I don't believe that. And I'm going to pick the wrong one right off the bat. Uh, let's, there you go. Okay. And, and so maybe it's that. Or maybe you're like, sure, in Joshua 10, okay, in the middle of battle, God just kind of made the sun freeze in the, in the sky for 24 hours straight. Yeah, like that could happen. That's not scientifically possible. I don't believe it. Right? Or maybe, maybe, man, you, don't, you believe, you're like, man, there's no way a loving God would ever send anyone to hell. I don't like that. I don't believe it. And see, see, as, as you begin to keep pulling things away and pulling things out, before long, things can come crashing down. Because um, see, what people don't re- realize is that what was once a strong tower is ready to fall. And when life gets hard, which it will, life always gets hard at some point. And when we can't see a way out, and, and when, when that God that we have manufactured in our mind, um, when, when he then allows something to happen that we didn't believe he would because that's not the God we believe in, then all of a sudden our faith falls apart. Besides, if you decided that some parts of God's word are not believable or can't be trusted, I'm going to be honest and say you're pretty crazy if you're still banking on Jesus for your salvation. I mean, think about that for a second. If you're saying, man, some of these things are just too hard to believe. I mean, can we believe that a God who's holy can look at us, our sins, our mistakes, all the ways that we've rebelled like in his face, that he's going to forgive us simply by trusting in Jesus and we don't have to do anything to earn that? That kind of sounds nuts. Unless, unless you see that the the God's word reflects an all-powerful God who often does things differently than we would choose. Now, even if he does things differently, it doesn't mean that his word isn't isn't true or that we can't trust it because in fact, all of it is true and we can trust in it fully. It's dangerous to pick and choose, but it's also dangerous because you might find yourself following false, following false teachers. And kind of, here's what I mean by this. You're like, no, man, I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow a false teacher. I'm not going to go wacko with some, you know, you know, go, I'm not going to go follow some wacko and Waco. If you don't know what that means, uh, just go talk to your parents. That's more their generation, right? But you're like, no, man, I wouldn't do that. But think about it for a minute. Because if you decide, maybe if you feel like certain parts of God's word are too hard to swallow, what happens if this charismatic, charming person who comes along and they claim to love Jesus and all of, the, all of a sudden they begin speaking and teaching right along the ways that you're feeling, right, right along uh, with what things are hard for you to swallow and they agree with you? It might be hard not to follow them, right? Check out what's, what we read in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Here's what it says. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. Itching ears. What does that mean? 
Well, when something itches, what do you do? You scratch it, right? For relief. That's what you do. And so here's the thing. This passage is warning us that if we listen to someone who's simply telling us what we want to hear because we're struggling with something that we find in God's word, that we might find ourselves moving away from what is actually true and buying into something that's a myth, that's a lie. And one last warning as to why, honestly, it's dangerous to pick and choose from the Bible is because when we do that, we put our self in the place of God. You put yourself in the place of God. And I don't think this is purposeful. It's not. We just don't logically think through this. And so if, if the Bible is the word of God, if we believe what Psalm 19 says when it says, the law of the Lord is, per- is perfect, the statutes of the Lord are trustworthy. If we believe that, if the, lo- if the Bible is from God and we inevitably choose not to believe part of it because we don't like it and so we don't believe it, what we're essentially saying to God, and I, and I know, I know I'm, I'm oversimplifying this. I really am. And I get that. But we're saying, God, I mean, I, I know you said this, but I, as a created being, as, a, as the one you created, who's not in control of anything, I have decided that you, God, are wrong and that I'm right. And that's essentially what we're saying and that somehow we know better than he does. Again, I don't truly believe that's anyone, anyone, is that ever anyone's intention? But in essence, that's what's happening. Guys, We need to study God's word because it is the rock on which we can stand. And not just parts of it. We need to take all of God's word and study it and really get to know it. Now, the next two points that I'm going to give you about why we why it's an essential thing for us to study God's word uh, actually comes from a great book that I, I came across again a couple weeks ago when I was really preparing for uh, this series. And the book's called um, Living by the Book by Howard Hendricks. And it's just a great one. And there's a couple things I just wanted to draw from there um, for you guys. And the first one is that not only is the Bible an essential source for us to stand firm, but the Bible also is an essential source for our growth, for our growth. Uh, First Peter 2.2 says this, 2.2, uh, like newborn infants long for spiritual milk that by it, you may grow up into salvation. Guys, as followers of, of Jesus, we're meant to grow. We're meant to grow up. We are meant to grow more and more like Jesus. We saw that the last two weeks, okay? And and that passage, that little short verse right there, gives us basically three things um, that we need to grow into God's word, okay? Here's the first thing that we need. We need the right attitude. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever spent any time around a newborn baby. Uh, The Binks are about to spend a lot of time around a newborn baby, but... um, If you've ever spent a time around a newborn baby, you know it almost seems like whenever they're awake they want to eat, right? Like every four to six hours, like it's like clockwork, right? Where all of a sudden that baby will start screaming. It wants its milk. That's what it wants. And and it won't be satisfied until it gets it, right? Until you put that bottle in its mouth. Um, in fact, it, it's kind of cool. As babies get a little bit older and they can kind of grab things, you'll actually find when you go to feed a baby its bottle, uh, literally you're coming close to it, it'll grab it out of your hand and shove it in. It, it just wants that. And guys, that's for us. We need to be about like that with God's word. We're like a newborn baby, man. We're like, we just want that. We can't live without it. And we just have to have that regularly in our life to keep filling us up. We have to have that kind of attitude. But we also see that we need an appetite for God's word. Peter, in this passage, uses the word long, right? Um, Think about your favorite meal. So if you're hungry, think about your favorite meal, okay? And you almost begin drooling over the thought. And now I've lost all of you because you're just thinking about that amazing thing you can't maybe can't get right now. You know, you're like, I just want a burrito from Chipotle, right? I don't know what it is. Matthew O'Hara, right? Um, But... You can almost taste it when you start thinking about it. Is it that good? And you're probably longing for that very thing. Now, perhaps right now, God's word does not sound all that appetizing to you. 
you tried it, you've choked it down, but not loving it at all, right? But God's word, guys, is an acquired taste. Though it might not be your favorite at first, the more and more that you have it, the more and more you're impacted by it, the better and better it tastes. The more and more you want it. You long for it. Maybe you're saying, if you're saying, hey, you know, I've tried reading my Bible. I just don't get anything out of it. Guys, I just want to challenge you to say, maybe that statement speaks more to the heart of the reader than it does about the content. And I want to challenge you, if that's you, keep trying. Keep going at it. Because the more you have it, the more you'll begin longing for it. Um, And also, the third thing we see is that in order for us to capitalize growing spiritually from God's word, we have to know that as Peter states, that the aim of spending time in God's word is not to know, but to grow. To grow up. That's the goal. I mean, you cannot grow without knowing, but you can know and know a lot and yet not grow. Um, as, you know, as we, as we come to know more and more and actually live that out in our everyday lives, that's when we begin to grow. Whether we've been a Christ follower for a long time or a short amount of time, there's always a danger guys of stunted growth. Uh, I have something here from my youngest. She's, she's now six, six and a half, as she'd probably tell me, um, uh, from something from our third birthday. Okay. And this is a giant, it's a giant one of those ruler things. Right. And we had, we had all the kids kind of who were at the party kind of line their heads up and we marked and put their name where they were. Now that was, you know, three and a half years ago. If they all came and they stood up and they were still right there, that'd be kind of weird, right? Because they're kids. They're meant to grow up, right? And they should, they should keep growing, keep growing, which you can't see the top of this, but that's what happens. They kind of get older and get taller and you keep remarking it as they grow. Um, now, if we did the adults and something like this, most likely what you would see is that most likely it stays the same. And if, if we were, weren't lying, as time goes on, we actually might get a little shorter even because, you know, we're getting old, right? But here's the thing with us guys as following Jesus, we are always meant to grow up. There's never a time like for us physically, there's a point where we get where we're kind of tapped out. We're as tall as we're going to get. We're not growing up anymore. But when it comes to God's word, we're always meant to grow up and we're always meant to go more and more. And if we're not growing, then we're actually shrinking. And that is, we're always meant to keep on growing. So guys, the Bible is an essential source for our growth. Um, But not only that, the Bible is also an essential source for our spiritual maturity. Um, As followers of Jesus, we become mature as we become more like Jesus. But how do we do that? Well, I want to look at another passage from Hebrews chapter 5, verses 11 to 14. Here's what it says. About this, we have much to say. And And it is hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basics of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have, who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to discern, distinguish, good from evil. Guys, for some people, school is tough. School is tough because they have a learning disability that that often inhibits them from learning um, as well as maybe somebody else could and and, and makes school more of a struggle. See, as as followers of Jesus, we're meant to learn, right? That's what we're meant to do and to grow. Um, But if we aren't careful, we can develop a learning disability because the writer of Hebrews here, he talks about the fact that, man, I have so much to tell his readers, but he's finding it hard to explain. And it's not because the content's too hard, but because their hearing was dull. And it wasn't something they were born with. It was actually something that was a result. It was almost a developed, a learned learning disability. And if we're not careful, we can almost do the same thing. 
um, because they should have been able to handle it, but they still weren't ready. So imagine this. Imagine you have a perfectly healthy, uh, you know, physically, mentally, intellectually, emotionally, perfectly healthy 18-year-old. Now, you'd imagine at that point that that person would be getting ready to go off into college, right? And that's, you know, given that amount of time, 18 years, that by that point, they should be ready to go off to college. But imagine how weird it would be if that person who should be college age, because of the amount of time, was actually about to go and jump in and learn their ABCs all over again with a bunch of toddlers. That'd just be weird, right? Um... Because it's almost like they're stuck. They're stuck as, as uh, infants, uh, not being able to handle solid teaching. Um, see, in verse 12, the writer of Hebrews says a key word, and that's time. By that point, given that amount of time, that Christ followers there should have been able to teach others truth. But instead of being able to teach others truth, this writer was having to teach them the basics all over again. And see, that's where a lot of Christ followers find themselves. Instead of them growing to the point where they can pour into others and be teaching others, instead, man, they're like, man, what was that? Like, how do I follow Jesus well? And they're just having to learn the basics all over again. They're stuck. They're stuck. They're stuck uh, like infants drinking milk instead of moving on to solid food. Um, and, and instead of, you know, being able to enjoy an amazing filet perfectly cooked with gorgonzola cheese crusted on top so good instead instead of being able to enjoy that they're still stuck drinking a bottle and drinking milk instead of being able to go on to meatier things instead and it they're having to learn more and when i may say learn this is what i mean they're not mature so what is it that makes someone mature? And I think this is really important because sometimes we think that if we know a lot, like if we have enough knowledge that we can out-argue the best of them, that maybe we have a lot of Bible verses memorized, that that somehow is what makes us mature. And I'm going to say that's actually not the case. And we see that here in, in, in verse 14. So here's what it says. But solid food is for the mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. See, as we look into the God's word, if we, as we hear what it says and we put it into practice in our lives, then what happens is our minds get trained. We are transformed to help us figure out um, what is pleasing to God. We can distinguish, we can, we can discern between what is good and what is wrong, what is right. And what is bad? I know I kind of reverse those, but that's okay. Um, guys, what we can do as we, as we take God's word, hear it and live it, and we grow in that discernment, is we can walk in a manner that is worthy of our calling. The person that's mature is not the person who thinks they know a lot about Jesus, but the person that lives like Jesus in everything they've come to know. Do you hear it? It's not the person who thinks they know a lot or they know a lot, but the most mature person, whether they know a little or they know a lot, the most mature person is the one who lives like Jesus in everything they've come to know. They live it out. That's maturity. Guys, I could keep, I could keep going on this subject of why the Bible is an essential source for our lives. But think of it simply this way. Maybe in your house, you have some cleaning chemicals, you have some Drano, you got some spray bottle of some cleaner. I'm guessing most of them, if you look at the back of it, you can, there's warnings and, you know, don't get in your eyes, don't do that. But almost all of them say harmful if swallowed. Sometimes they even say deadly, right? Don't swallow it. But I'm going to say God's word is a little bit different. I'm going to say this. If God's word, guys, if it's not swallowed, if we don't take it, for what it is, the very words of the God of the universe spoken to us, if we don't listen to it and then live it out, then that's harmful. That's harmful to us. We grow, we, instead of growing up, 
We grow in a learning disability. We can't, instead of being able to enjoy the meteor things and, and more things that God has for us, instead we're stuck in the basics. Guys, God has so much for us. You know, I wish we were like in our room uh, and you were all sitting in front of me where I could see all your amazing faces, but right now I'm just looking at a camera. Um, but what I know I could see if we were in that room and you were sitting in front of me is I would see a room of amazing young men, young women who God has given amazing talents, gifts, passions to, and people who have their struggles. But guys, my, my hope, my heart for you guys in this, in all of this, is that you will allow God to make you new. You allow him to take all those things he's given to you and you allow him to use that. As you, as you say, man, this life's not about me, um, but I'm, my life will be all about Jesus. And he takes what he's given to you and he allows you to use it for something that is not just about you, but really about other people and about Jesus. And, and you see it impact people people and, and, and things for all of eternity. I'd love for you guys to be people who are not blown and tossed in the wind, not knowing what to believe or not knowing what's right and wrong, but for you instead to be able to stand firm on God's word and to say, man, I, God, I know life is hard sometimes. And it's hard to always understand what this world is saying. I'm so grateful that I can stand firmly upon your word. And it gives me everything I need. It's, it's that light unto my path that I can walk. Guys, God has amazing things for you. But you have to walk in that. Don't think of it as happening automatically. Continue to grow up. Continue to mature. Become more like Jesus. Surrender to the Holy Spirit each and every day. And allow God to make you into who he created you to be which is a version of Jesus that looks just like you. Let me pray. God, I just thank you so much for these students. God, I pray, Father God, that your word that we talked about tonight would be that rock on which they stand. God, as they come and go, as they move on to high school and then they move on to college and they move on to getting old and being married and having jobs and all this kind of stuff and having kids. God, every step of the way, every moment in life, every different um, kind of era for them will be marked by them being able to be stand firm no matter what life throws at them upon the truth that is found in your word. And it would not just be a bunch of head knowledge, but they would be true reflections of you as they live this out each and every day. God, I pray that through your spirit, you would bring all this about for your glory and your honor. And pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Love you guys. We'll see you soon.